Some people are just hypo aroused. They're just not motivated enough. And those people would benefit greatly from cultivating practices like super oxygenated breathing. Mm -hmm. So this is something along the lines of like tumo type breathing. So rapid, and we look at this in the lab, we're actually running a human study on this now. So 25 or 30 deep breaths through the nose and out through the mouth, then exhaling the breath and holding, learning to how to self-generate adrenaline. That's what you're doing yeah, when you're doing some that. Some version of the Wim Hof yeah, technique. Or that's what, what that is. Brian McKenzie talks about. Right, a, a, an ice bath is doing the exact same thing. Stimulating adrenaline response, it, it actually improves the immune system. There's a mm -hmm. published paper on this, releases adrenaline, which buffers the immune system against infection. But getting good at taking yourself from low, low energy to higher energy and then learning how to compress your focus. And I'll talk about the focus thing in a minute. Some people are so agitated, the monkey mind, they got too many things going on and they're thinking, okay, they're trying to sit down and write. I suffer from this and I'm feeling like, wait, I've also got this person I need to connect with and I'm kind of dr being drawn off course by not being able to put the blinders on. For people that have that issue, I think learning how to calm the nervous system is very powerful. And the best way that I know how to do that is based on two studies, one published in Nature, one published in Cell Reports recently, showing that physiological size, there's actually a thing in the literature called physiological size, are one of the fastest ways to bring our overall levels of autonomic arousal down. And a physiological sigh is a two inhales followed by an extended exhale. So it's like, it's not just a deep breath, it's two inhales followed by an exhale, mm -hmm. okay? And the, what that what that does, and this has been shown several times now in humans and other species as well, is it dilates the, the little sacs of the lungs, and that second inhale dilates them a little bit more, and it pulls a little bit of carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream so that when we exhale, we offload the maximum amount of carbon dioxide, and it perfectly adjusts the ratio of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the bloodstream and lungs. And sometimes it only takes one of these double inhale exhales, sometimes, somebody needs to do two or three. But that's the fastest way to bring the autonomic nervous system down. A lot of people need such a tool because I think we talk a lot about meditation and tools for calm and you know I can go to Esalen for a weekend and get a massage, I'm gonna feel very good, but then when I'm thrown back in real life, I need something that's gonna work in real time, what I call a real time tool. And most people don't know how to control their autonomic nervous system because it's complicated. I can't control my liver function. I can eat, that will calm me, but that has complicated you know, issues with it too, if I'm just eating to calm yeah. myself. So the diaphragm is the one skeletal muscle organ that was internally, right? We've got obviously skeletal muscles designed to move things. It's a skeletal muscle organ, unlike the spleen, the liver, the heart, et cetera. It was designed to be moved vol voluntarily. And these physiological sighs are actually occurring fairly regularly during sleep to adjust our levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen. And there's a recent study showing that in claustrophobia, this is the breathing pattern that people default to, mm. to try and offload that carbon dioxide. So whereas there are a lot of really interesting uh, breathing techniques, Wim Hof, Brian McKenzie does great work, uh, Patrick McEwen, you know, the, uh, Laird and Gabby, the tons of, of people doing really interesting things out there. My lab has been focused on what are the neural circuits that are designed to achieve particular states that happen to impinge on and capture diaphragm function. And so the reason I think breathing is so powerful is that everyone has a diaphragm and it's the immediate link to the body. A lot's been made of the vagus nerve, you know, uh -huh. oh, the vagus is the path between the body and mind, but the vagus is very slow. The vagus nerve calming is what you experience when you eat a really rich, a carbohydrate rich meal, or you're, you've had a long day and, you're, and you put your feet up and you're finally relaxing. It takes minutes to hours to kick in. Whereas the diaphragm is real-time control over your brain state. So the brain knows what the body is doing by how fast the diaphragm is moving. It knows its overall activation state. So when you breathe quickly, those 25 or 30 breaths, the brain says, oh, I must be alert. I'm gonna start secreting some noradrenaline. And when you breathe slowly, that level of noradrenaline drops down. So it sounds so simple, but I think it's only in the last two or three years that my lab and Mark Krasnow's lab at Stanford and other labs elsewhere in the world have started to identify the neurons in the brain that are linked to breathing and how those two things relate to one another. And mm. I think everybody should have a kit of tools yeah. that they can use to bring themselves down and ramp themselves up. 
I'll just say one other thing about focus. So when we're in a high alert state, something very powerful happens that I think partially explains your, um, your ability now to drop into this book writing. When there's a certain amount of adrenaline in our system, our pupils dilate. Remember, the eyes are not connected to the brain. Our eyes are actually two pieces of central nervous system. They are two pieces of brain outside the skull that were designed to control our overall arousal state. And so we can talk about this as it relates to sleep and sleep quality, but when I bring up the level of adrenaline in my body through breathing, or let's say I see a troubling text, or let's just say I, um, I just use a very Goggins type approach and just figure out the most painful, <laughs> inspiring for me reason to yeah. do it. You know, it's, it, it sounds vague because obviously, David, I don't know what goes on in your head, but a tremendous respect for your ability to do this. But he just ratchets himself out of that ditch and puts himself in motion. The pupils dilate. And when that happens, our visual system actually enters something that's a little bit more like portrait mode on our phone. Mm. There's a process called accommodation and your ability to focus on one thing visually actually becomes better and your ability to see everything else blurs away. And that's the ability to just see that screen of text or that if you work, work on you know pad and paper to just see that pad and paper. Uh -huh. And then as you start writing, what people don't realize is that mental focus follows visual focus. Now, in blind people, it's slightly different. It follows auditory focus. But in, in most people, your visual focus, as you bring that into really sharp relief, that image of your book, and you stare at it, you're gonna feel some agitation and your mind's gonna be jumping all over the place. But if you wait just a couple minutes, the rest of the world will disappear. I think this is sort of like the flow state people are looking for. But remember the gate of entry is one of, you have to wade through some, some sewage before you can swim in clear water. Right. That's the way I always think about it. But the visual focus is what brings the rest of the brain into cognitive focus. And people in the martial arts understand this. You've probably experienced this running when you're feeling exhausted and you can just concentrate on one milestone and get there. You can almost bring that into like, you, what you're doing is you're linking that to the dopamine circuitry. You're saying that thing is the milestone, not winning the race, not some other thing outside this, this immediate environment, that thing. And when you're able to start capturing these peripheral circuits, meaning the body, the diaphragm, the visual system, then you start getting past this whole idea of mindsets and it really becomes about the body setting the mind. And this is where I think when you say action leads the rest, mm -hmm. right? It's that's a, what you're saying is a, is grounded in real neuro, neurobiological data.